At TVC News, wherever the big news story is happening, we're geared up to break it. TVC News, first with breaking news. Hello and thank you for joining us on Journalist Hangout on Sunday. I am Ola Jumoke Olatunji. Today on the program, mixed reactions over President Tinubu's first 100 days in office. Senator Yarima advises federal government to dialogue with bandits. And later on the show, federal government saves 400 billion naira in four weeks from subsidy removal. Today, I will be hanging out with Adewalia Adewye and Dosun Waladipo. Gentlemen, welcome to Journalist Hangout on yeah, Sunday. Happy, happy Sunday to you. Happy Sunday to you too, Jumoke. All right. If you're ready, Journalist Hangout starts now. Thank you very much for staying with us. So let's begin with what makes Lagos tick social and commercial potential. The chairman of the Southeast Governors Forum and governor of Imo State, Hope Zodima, the deputy speaker of House of Representatives, Benjamin Kalu, and some leading Igbo businessmen met with the Lagos State Governor, Abadjide Smawulu, to resolve the conflict generated by demolition of structures at the Alaba International Market, Lagos. Igbos have now been reassured that they are free to go about their legitimate businesses in Lagos without any fear. The meeting also resolved the rancor generated by outcome of the 2023 general elections. Gentlemen, I mean, so according to reports, this is like a follow-up to an earlier meeting held uh, that involved the governor of um, uh, Enugu State, so that's Peter Amba. So it's beautiful to see that uh, sensitive issues like this can be resolved amicably. Let me start with you. What do you mean? Well, I think the, I first of all commend the efforts of the governors because it shows that they realize their constituency is not just within their state alone. Mm. Whatever affects their own people outside, you know, their territorial space is also of concern to them. And then you realize that most of these people are from different parts of the uh, uh, southeast. When it's time to vote, they go back home to vote. And so okay. I think what the governors did you know, should be commended. However, we have to look at the, uh, we have to look objectively at the positions of both parties. The Lagos State government is saying that um, there are some 17 buildings and according to the Lagos State government, beyond redemption, that needed to be demolished. And I think demolition is not just restricted to a particular place. It has been ongoing in Lagos State. We all know, even where I live, I think a small bridge is being constructed and some buildings were, you know, are demolished in that area. So I think the Lagos State government, we need to also understand its own context. There is a problem of dealing with urban renewal which is a major problem. After years of military law, no respect for that urban planning laws, no people built just anyhow. In order the military, you can just get your, you know, your approval, you know, because of corruption, because of lack of transparency. And this thing went on for about 27 years. So that inherited problem is there. And when you are trying to remodel the city, you will confront some of these uh, challenges. Alaba was uh, first put in place around 1978 under the military government. And it was based on the conjecture, you know, that was, that Lagos was witnessing at that time. At that place, there was no local authority until, I think, 1989, when the, first, when the local government was created for them. So since that time, for years under military rule, there were, there were no people don't have respect for, it's not just related to Alaba alone. So I think there's that challenge of remodeling Lagos, which... Um, there's, there's no way the government will not confront some of these uh, problems. But at the same time, we also have to realize that people's livelihood is involved. So we have to balance, you know, uh, both, uh, you know, the interests of both parties. But I think setting up a committee is a very unique thing. Okay. And I would advise that that committee should not just look into demolition of buildings or no demolition of buildings alone. I know there are indigenous people in that area, that community. 
the history of uh, Alaba or Jolukawe did not start with the Alaba market. It's been over 400 years. So there are people that own that land who are also complaining that they didn't get enough compensation when that land was taken away from them. Most of these people that own this land, billions of funds are made on their own ancestral land, but nothing comes to them. When you go there, you see them as you know, carrying loads, being cobblers, nothing to feed on, nothing to live on, and it's their ancestral land. So that committee should have a broad mind to look at all the facets of issues that are involved. But I think it's a good development. And it, that's why we always tell people that when there is a conflict, we must look for a way to resolve it. And there is no dispute that we cannot resolve if we are really um, practicing democracy. So I think uh, it's, a, it's a good development forward. And I hope the committee will be able to look at all the issues involved and then come out with a resolution that will satisfy all the parties involved. All right, so I would like you to re add to this uh, very important uh, point idea you just raised. But before then, how necessary was this uh, uh, peace initiative? I think it's good. But at the same time, um, when I heard that leaders from the Southeast left whatever they were doing to come to Lagos over this matter, I was also shocked. Mm. Because I think the issues are very straightforward. And that's part of what you know. It is just unfortunate that because of the ethnic coloration that was brought to bear on the 2023 elections, yes, yeah. we're only focusing on this issue on Alaba as if it was a fallout of that election. I mean, it's been there. It's been there. Before. These buildings that have been demolished and are also scheduled for demolition, They've been marked since 2016. It's just unfortunate, like we've said a couple of times on this program, that government lacks the political will a lot of times to act on pending disasters. We've seen a lot of buildings going down in Lagos. And by the time the people in charge, the authorities that are coming out to speak, they'll say, we've marked it for demolition a long time ago. So what have you been doing? No action. If you have 349 buildings that are defective in a marketplace, and not just any marketplace, a labor market, that millions visit every day, and you are allowing them to still stand today, then it's an indictment of the government. Absolutely. Big one. So if you have demolished 17, and some people are saying, see, we've come to make peace then for me, it, it means they don't understand what the issues are. It means what you are saying to the Lagos State government is, leave these buildings to kill our brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. Also, it's been established that a lot of these places that we are talking about, they are like shanties. We are hoodlums, criminals hide. Just this year, some shanties were set ablaze in that area. And arms and ammunition brought out. A lot of people were arrested with weed and other drugs. Mm. So if we are looking at what the real issues are, I don't see a need for that meeting. But if you are talking about the ethnic coloration introduced into the last election, well, maybe that's what they have come to resolve. But we should not resolve that issue at the expense of people's lives. Because when it happens, we are now going to cry again. Government will budget some money, give to the families of the bereaved. Mm -hmm. We are asked we could have prevented it. And that's, that, for me, is what should be discussed. If the government cannot afford to, on its own, say, OK, we are going to build, because we've seen areas where government took over markets. For instance, Alade Market, Allen Avenue, is still pending. People were taken out of those places, a, a couple of them, until today. Government is yet to fulfill its promise to replace those buildings brought down in order to give those who are trading there back their means of livelihood. If government cannot do it, we've seen areas where you have the PPP. Give it out. Let people, put, let people trade in an environment where they feel secure. Let them trade in environments where area boys are not the ones who are lording it over them. Let, them. let buildings not crumble on them while they are trading. That, for me, is what 
is of more importance than saying that you are coming to make peace. I don't see any peace in this. It's purely a matter of saving lives. Purely. Purely from now. All right, so uh, Mr. Doe, I mean, you just talked about uh, the lack of political will of the government to deal with pending disasters. Mm -hmm. Where do we go from here? Well, there's no doubt that that, that is, you know, um, a very important aspect of the debate. And then, um, like we have said, it's not just Alaba alone. There are all sort of, some of these buildings that you will see that collapse, you know, there have been warnings for months. You know, nothing yes. is part of the government. Yes. And when the building now collapses, when you go back, you discover that people have been giving warnings for more than six, five months, you know, even sometimes years. So the government needs to assert its political way because what is important is the utilitarian value, the, 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 the good of the general public, you know, their welfare, their livelihood, to save lives. So how so huge is the impact of, away by sentiment? How huge is the impact of corruption on this particular issue? I mean, we have several distressed buildings in Lagos. Yeah, well, we, we, we've had so many stories, both confirmed and non-confirmed, of people being sacked in government for including commissioners I'm yeah. for um, taking bribes or doing shady things when it comes to demolition. And I hope that is not the case here. I sincerely hope that it is this issue of don't let it be seen as we, negotiants or monile, yeah. against they, mm. The Igbos, who are our, who are our visitors. Mm. Because as far as this country is concerned, there is no visitor anywhere. It's just unfortunate that certain pronouncements come in the midst of issues like this. There was a pronouncement that went out by the Speaker of the Lagos State House of Assembly mm. saying the people will want to claim back their economic life. We are, we are all Nigerians. Mm. And we can be anywhere. We can find ourselves anywhere. There was a time that most of those who were local government chairmen in, in, in some states in the far north, Sokoto, Zamfara, and the rest, they were people from Ogumosho in Oyo State who settled in there and grew with the people. So there is nothing wrong once it's about once businesses are joined, done genuinely and um, legally following the laid down rules and laws. Nothing is wrong. But in this case, where people take bribes to ensure that some buildings are not demolished, you mark them. Uh, let, 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 me, let me quote the, the, the general manager of um, Lagos State Building Control Agency, who said some of the buildings have been marked for demolition several times. Mm -hmm. Meaning, they go there, maybe by the time they are coming back, they, the owners have repented it, covered up the seal, and then still go mark it again. Such people should be in, in prison because they are lost gui gui they are guiding those things. That once there is a seal on your building, you don't have a right to remove it. So what happened? Who were those who went back there to check on these buildings and found that the owners have removed the seal? or painted the, the uh, markings on the wall. Those people should be in prison by now. All right, so Mr. Doe, I like uh, the direction Mr. Doe is taking us, because uh, to wrap this up, I mean, nearly every tribe in the country has one or two persons living in Lagos, so we cannot overemphasize the importance of peaceful uh, coexistence. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that is right. But at the same time, we need to also uh, uh, be conscious of uh, um, international laws on the rights of indigenous peoples. You know, all over the world, indigenous peoples are fighting to preserve their history, preserve their culture, preserve their heritage from cosmopolitan, uh, you, know, uh, co you know, from cosmopolitan developments that may overwhelm and lead to their own extinction. So history, uh, Lagos, and uh, just like Onicha anywhere, has its own history that cannot be demolished because of civilization. So those culture, those traditions, those in indigenous knowledge, those values, those sacred groups mm. that they have kept for centuries,
cannot be subverted by industrialization. And that's why there is, the United Nations is very clear on it. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, that most countries, almost every country, at least about 143 countries, you know, are subscribed to. You know what is going on in Abuja now? Is they have about 2 million people that their lands were taken away, only stipends were paid to them. Mm -hmm. And they are getting nothing. They are rising up now about nine ethnic groups saying, look, this is our land, this is our culture. In fact, when I went, they were having a meeting and I was attending in Abuja. They said where they have the national stadium was an ascensional worship place for them. That even the actual rock was a sacred groups for them. It was taken over by the flag government. It's caught a whole lot of conflict in the great religion, in Maghreb, in East Africa. So we cannot be, we cannot lose sight of that issue in Lagos. And I think that's what the speaker was talking about, the national, the state has said that our culture, the heritage of Lagos, the values must be preserved. At the same time, recognizing the national constitution that people have the right to live wherever they want to live. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Let's move on. Uh, the fear of further hike in price of petrol remains after fuel subsidy removal by the federal government. The Independence Petroleum Marketers Association of Nigeria, IPMAN, and the Association of Distributors and Transporters of Petroleum Products have dismissed rumor of hike in the price of fuel to 700 naira per litre. Associations, however, noted that fuel price is now being driven by market forces, and given the current high exchange rate, the pump price of petrol could increase. I mean, isn't this uh, contradictory in a way? Said also. Well, I... And to play the devil's advocate, I mean, Nigerians say that once you hear anything as speculation, I mean, it may take two weeks, it may take three weeks, it will eventually come to, come to reality. Yeah, but even that speculation was talking about the um, end of July. And the driving force there is what happens in the international market. This is our own exchange rate. Now the exchange rate for both the official and the uh, other markets have been collapsed. They are operating at about the same level now. So it's not impossible that there will be upward and downward movement in terms of price. But I think the key thing is that if government has decided that it does not want to regulate the price of petrol, especially because others have been done a long time mm -hmm. ago, then it should be left to the people who, who, who are importing this thing to decide. NMPC, as of today, is the major importer. Can we license others and provide them the enabling, enabling environment to import? Dangote refinery is coming on stream. Can we allow it also to work without regulation? I think that mm -hmm. is what we should be looking at. So that if today we buy it at 500 Naira, tomorrow we may be able to find it at 300 Naira. The following day it may go to 400 Naira, but let the market forces determine that. When we started with the issue of mobile telephone, we know that now, I mean, now we know what is happening now and what happened then. When they told us that we couldn't do per second billing, we are ones to make a call, even if it's only two seconds and the thing cuts off, you are paying for a whole minute. Now it's a different ball game because that sector was allowed to evolve on its own. A lot of people are arguing that you can't leave petrol at that level because they see Communication via phone as luxurious. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a luxury. It's not. It's also business. Now, when you look at what happened with telecoms at that time, especially when it became cheaper, everybody was making calls as they, as they liked, mm -hmm. as they loved. And they were getting away with it. When the economy became a bit tougher. 
our usage. We won't adjust it. Came down. Yeah. And it's still going now. Everybody is looking for a cheaper means of communicating. So also are people now looking for cheaper means of handling issues that have to do with petrol. Some park their vehicles somewhere, join buses to work. If, you, if I don't need to go and see my friend and it's a matter of life and death, I won't go. Because people have now, the, the question to ask is, I want to go from Ikeja to go and greet my friend on the island. What's the purpose? What's the purpose? Mm. So we're beginning to tighten our own belts ourselves, even without being told. So nobody is expected now to say, we're now going to keep fixing or uh, doing permutation. Let the day speak for itself. But let government also grant more licenses for importation. Mm. And quickly, too, so people can bring in this product. When there is competition, Something is going to give way. Certainly, I'm sure of that. All right, so Mr. Dutton, I mean, uh, Ipman says no plan to hike petrol to <laughs> 700 naira per liter. Well, the bottom line is that the essence of government is to create law and order. Mm. There cannot be law and order when people are hungry and when people have to every day. You know, it's about promises of tomorrow. People, want, people have to live for today before they can even think of seeing that um, great tomorrow you are promising them. Nigerians have passed through very difficult moments this past eight years. That is the truth. What was the exchange rate in 2015? I think about 198 or so. Now, what was our debt? What was the GDP in 2000? If they compare with what we have now. So we are, Nigerians are very kind people, honestly. Some countries do not take what is going on. And what the average Nigeria is just looking for is just to eat. They are not asking for too much. So if you have seen what we, I mean, if you, if you notice what we passed through these first few months, mm -hmm. the Naira swap, we took the money everybody had. You know, people packed them and put them in the bank. We want to give them new notes. At the end of the day, those new notes we are not getting there. If you go to bank now, the same money you give to them. Yeah. And many yeah. businesses collapse because of this policy. So the, the government, the, the, government you know, this, the country has been left in a mess. And that is why among those who have contested the election, really only very few of them, three of them even, you know, has the capacity to handle the challenges. We have. Forget about people are talking campaign and all that. They do understand the depth of the problem that Nigeria is at this moment. So it needs extra creativity. This is a lot of experience. That's why when they're talking about increment, this increase that we had these few weeks, people are passing through hello. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some people have lost their lives because of this mm -hmm. increase. So we, mo they, they, we cannot just live our life to market forces. Market forces is about human beings now. Government at every time must intervene, you know, to be able, that, to, be able to, to ensure that you intervene so that things do not get out of order. Now, the petroleum importers, if Naira crashes, it will affect them. They will need to pay in dollars. So if your, your, your Naira depreciates, you are going to have a problem because the more you, you know, the, it goes up, the more you pay, you know, because you have to buy in dollar anyway. So government needs to create, you know, look for a creative way. But personally, I'm not any other illusion. There are things will be resolved in the first few months. It's going to be very tough. Okay. For instance, look at the fuel that we are, I mean, crude oil we are exporting. People don't ask the question. One, if you eat crude oil, there are about more, close to 20 byproducts. PVC, uh, nap, uh, naphthalene, bitumen, polyester, fertilizer. So when you take your crude oil outside, you are selling it $1. But you are losing a lot. Because if you refine it at home, there are so fertilizer. You know, all these items you are using. They are products of you know, uh, polyester. PVC, pipes. So what happens to these byproducts? You just take them abroad, you refine, and then you bring in. What happens to other things? That means that one barrel of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, that you are selling, maybe $77, is actually about $200. If you look at other byproducts associated with that one barrel. What happens to those things? That's why we, the, the long-term plan must start now. We must ensure we 
produce, we refine our, 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 our you know, crude oil at all. Mm -hmm. So that we can save a lot of money. We don't need to be buying dollar. We buy in Naira. It's going to improve the economy to create more jobs. But as long as we depend on importing, you know, uh, uh, finished products of things that we produce here, you produce yam, you now go and pound this in Ghana and then bring it back. We are not going to be able to deal with uh, these challenges. All right. So just before we move on, I mean, just because Mr. Dotto mentioned this earlier, uh, the Nigerian Midstream and Downstream Petroleum Regulatory Authority uh, says it has issued licenses to five companies for the importation of fuel. Yeah, it said so. So what's the significance of this? Well, it's a step forward, mm. like we've said. But if it can do more, it's fine. Let there be competition. Government will always give you a range. And since NMPC remains the largest importer, if we have all the uh, majors selling at a particular price, nobody is going to come and do anything significantly different. So in a way, that means there is control in whatever we are doing. But we need more people to bring it in so that there can be competition. If I see a two naira difference, I can, for instance, if I need to fill maybe a car that is about 100 liters, and I see a two naira difference between one filling station and the other, I can go to the other mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. It saves me 200 naira, but that 200 naira can buy me a bottle of water or coke. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so let's move on. Uh, though policemen continue to display misconduct in the discharge of their duties, it is gratifying to note that such behaviors are met with punishment. The acting inspector general of Leeds, Olukayo Diagbetoku, has summoned the officers who used a vehicle to run over a handcuffed man in a viral video in Ekwomaido State. In a statement, the police spokesperson, Olumuiwa Dijobi, said the IGP condemned the act, adding that the errant police officers have been asked to report to the force headquarters on Monday. The victim was handcuffed by a team of officers attached to the Ekwoma Police Division over his refusal to allow them to go through his mobile phones. Uh, before we discuss this issue, let's share uh, the story with you. October 2020, the country witnessed a nationwide protest by youths calling for an end to police brutality, extortion, harassment, and unlawful arrests. Three years down the line, it appears some officers and men of the police force have come back to their vomits. These angry youths condemned the incident and called for justice. Dehumanizing the characters of citizens that are living in Umudumu, uh, Umudumu in particular, because I will encourage the police to talk to their men and see a way of stopping this un un unwarranted attitude of the policemen in Ekoma, because they have, they have done so many avocs, breaking into people's compounds. Police in particular, most of them, they are, they are, the, they are the nuisance that they are supposed to be eradicated in the community. How can you say you are a policeman, you came to arrest somebody, the same person you arrest left the vehicle where you kept him and he was lied down on the road and you match it. They should, they should give them orientation, they should educate them. When you go to arrest someone, you are under arrest. The person will follow you to your station, then you address your issue. Not that you will come to meet somebody, you say, okay, you are under arrest. Okay, you handcuff the person, uh, you will be beating the person, be molesting the person because you are a policeman, you are using police gun. It's thing like that. It's not ideal. Responding, police hierarchy in the state say the seven officers involved in the act have been taken into custody for possible investigation and prosecution. The information gathered from the police was that they were not aware that he laid on the floor. And eventually, their vehicle ran over him. The CP condemned their actions and described it as barbaric, inhuman, and unprofessional. There were a team of policemen, seven in number, seven, name withheld as the investigation is ongoing. The yet to be identified victim of the incident is currently receiving treatment in the hospital. Paul. Ezenwa, TVC News, Ekboma, Edo State. I mean, this is another pathetic story coming out from the police force. But one question I think the Nigerian police still needs to answer is, why does the leadership of the force 
is a directive and the men on the streets always, always go against this directive. What exactly is happening? Well, I think it's just that um, they care more about their pocket than doing the right thing. Um, when this news filtered in, one of the reports that came in, you would have even heard it from those that were interviewed, was that those guys in Epoma, they become a pawn in the flesh of the people. And their target, usually, young people using expensive phones, mm -hmm. so-called expensive phones, because some of them may not be, mm -hmm. especially now that the value of the Naira against the dollar has made everything um, expensive. Some of them, you know, they, w one of the reports has it that they confiscate the phones, take them to a forest to extort them. When they, to, when, they, when they would have told them they were taking them to station, they also said, one, the draft report also said, they no longer use POS operators mm. to, to retrieve money for, or collect money from their victims. Rather, what they have done is to open different accounts on the platform of one of the mini banks that usually only demand for your telephone number to open an account. Mm. Okay. So that's, they've just gone ahead to open different accounts. Not even in Nigeria where some of us have four, the four major lines. So they've, they've done that across those mini banks that make you. So where, where you have people who don't care, if you look at it, in the last one year, so many of them have been dismissed. So many. Even an incident here in Lagos where... It looks like dismissal is no longer a big deal. Yes, it's not, it's not a big deal for them because, mm -hmm. like we found out over the years, they still find their way back into the force. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what makes it not a big deal. They still find their way back. Because there is usually, usually you don't have a, a means of checking some of these things. There is no database. database. There is no record. You say this, this man has committed an offense. A lot of things people get away with. One man was caught um, uh, in Akwaibom for killing his son. The same man committed the same offense in Lagos, killed somebody, he, has co he committed the same offense in Abia State. Why is that man on the move? If you ask. So if the man was not caught and brought in for questioning, nobody would have known he committed such an offense in other places. And he's there on the streets, moving, because there are no records to say, this man is a criminal. So that's the same thing that happens in the force. You may find these guys now, maybe going, going to join the Navy, the mm -hmm. um, Army, or another um, military or paramilitary, and life continues. And the same attitude in them. No, sir. You can imagine the one that stole the rifle of his colleague and took it home to go and hide under his uh, mattress and raised an alarm that his colleague, I mean, his own rifle, he went to hide it in his own house and raised an alarm that his colleague stole the rifle. So when they were looking for it and searched the houses of all others who were involved, who were on duty that day, thank God for the Deputy Commissioner of Police who said, okay, you raise the alarm, go to his house, and they found it under his own mattress, a policeman. Meaning that what he wanted to do was to take that rifle to himself and mm -hmm. possibly sell it. So those are the kind of characters that you still find on the, on the road as policemen. These are things that we need to deal with. There was a time when the NSAS came and the police said it was going to um, conduct various tests. What has become of it? We have not had that based on that test. Some people have been dismissed for, for having drugs in their system. Some people have been dismissed for psychotic behavior. Nothing. Once something happens, we complain, we shout, we do this, and then it dies down, waiting for the next victim. It's pathetic, and I think so, it must be So, Mr. Dade, I mean, to be very honest, this is another story that may die down. Because I know that uh, the first spokesperson and the former IGP have constantly talked about, uh, have said that no policeman has the right to check your phone, except, uh, except if such a phone is marked as an exhibit in a pending case before a court of law. 
The police have said this over and over and over again. Mm. This is just a clear case of extortion. When somebody is holding a the telephone, then you want to see what is inside. And the, the phone is it's an ancestry of so many internet is there, you can discover so many things there that are not that do not even belong to the owner of that phone. And then um, this thing has been ongoing for some time. If this had happened in the United States, we'll be talking about racism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. This is black man to black man. To black man. And I'm appalled by the excuse of the police mm -hmm. that, <coughs> excuse me, the, the driver didn't know <laughs> that somebody was lying down. <coughs> if your car rides <coughs> on an object, you should know. Even a small stone, not to talk of a human being. So this idea of the police trying to defend the wrong conduct in a tactical way gives us a lot of worry about the character of the police itself. And I think we need to concern ourselves about recruitment of people into the police force. What kind of people do we recruit into the police force? Is this a situation where one senator will just send 10 names? When he gets there, he's loyal to the senator. He believes the police commissioner cannot do anything to him. Mm. Or an MI, an OBA, OB, will just give recommendation. He's OB's boy. He's a OBA's boy. He's MI's boy. What can happen to him? When the commissioner an offense, you transfer him, what happens? Then what kind of training are we giving to our policemen? Is it one of training? Do we give them psychological training? Do we give them reorientation? Demilitarization? Then what is the kind of, how frequent is the kind of training we give our policemen? I cannot imagine a policeman riding in a vehicle and then you climb on top of a human being. That could have led to violent uprising. The mm -hmm. people would have risen up, attacked policemen, and if we have not seen this video, they will have been denied. They won't deny nothing like that happened. I mean, they even said uh, that uh, <coughs> the man was driving an unregistered car. He resisted arrest, allegedly inflicted injuries on the officers, and destroyed the police vehicle. Why, why that kind of defense? I know my worry is that you understand the IG summoned them to Abuja. That also raises fundamental questions about the structure of discipline. If somebody commits an offense in Chicago, should he be invited to? Washington, D.C. Mm. There should be a mechanism of discipline. If somebody commits an offense in Epoma or in, uh, anywhere, Iyala, there should be a, a standard measure of discipline, not until you have to invite him to come to Abuja. So there is a CP there, there is AIG. Mm -hmm. What are they doing? Must they go to Abuja before they are disciplined? So I, I think we need to be worried because where, where you don't have the police force that is disciplined, there's no way you can enjoy public confidence. When you are looking for criminals, people will hide them in order to seek revenge against you. Because they realize that two weeks ago, I was beaten by a policeman, my brother was killed. Why should I support you when you are looking for criminals? So we want to see this is the first test for the IG. That started well, as we met with the uh, CPs. He met with the IGs, he has come with, with a, a policy direction. This is the first test for him. We want to see these policemen disciplined. We want to see sanctions imposed on them to serve as president. You said whether we are going to bury this case. It depends on the media, not the police alone. The media and human rights organizations must keep a tap on this case and ensure that we bring it to front burner until justice is done. So quickly before we go, I mean, he just mentioned the fact that the new IGP has a lot of work to do. Uh, they are said he would have to focus on attitudinal and behavioral changes of these officers. How important is this? Very, very, very important. It's key. And in, in doing that, he must be aware, like Nigerians have told him, that some of the... Uh, issues, he said they will tackle in office. <laughs> we also had those promises. Mm. 
mm. by his. Uh, I, I was going to say that. Yeah, mm -hmm. we had those promises by those who came before him. So, until we see concrete action, not just promises, we won't be able to trust him. Because, like um, Mr. Liu said, it's a matter of trust now. We need to believe in, the, in our police force. Uh, we, are hoping, we, we are not uh, just, you shouldn't tell us that the police is your friend. We want to feel that the police is my friend. It happens. And these guys, because I was appalled by what the public relations officer in Edo State said, that the, he, he himself should even ask the question, that is the guy an ant that you will be, pu you'll be pushing a old man being with the vehicle and trying to ride over him, no. and then you are saying, I tell them when, when I'm chance to meet with, whether it's CP or see, it's good you believe your officers. But at the same time, you yourself go on the road, mm. especially at night, and see what happens. They tell a lot of lies. They tell a lot of lies. And that's why you see some Nigerians, they have cameras in their vehicles mm. now. Because it helps a lot. Somebody, you, you, you can see this is what has happened, and then you are turning it, because you, you're already in the office, you couldn't extort the man. And then you now turn, the li turn it into yeah, a lie. This is a very So those are, the, those are the things that we need to quickly change, so that the officers who sit in the office don't just listen to their story and say, because he's my colleague, Esprit yeah. Decor, yeah. is the one I'm going to believe. Those guys lie a lot. We will continue to monitor this story and we hope that uh, justice is served. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Let's move on. Uh, the most eagerly anticipated decision of President Bola Tinubu is appointment of ministers that will serve in his cabinet. The Southwest Youth Forum has urged President Tinubu not to appoint any of the past governors as ministers in his cabinet. Chairman of the Forum, Funshaw Ajimuda, accused most of the past governors of plundering their states into huge domestic and foreign debts. He urged the president to appoint better hands, technocrats, and individuals willing to transform uh, the country. Let me start with you. Well, interestingly, I know uh, Funshua Jimuda very well. I think, uh, theoretically, I think he, he means well. You know, uh, you, you raise the argument of some the governors associated with corruption. Some dismantled their states. Some left their days in debt. But then, as journalists, uh, we are concerned with facts. It is the responsibility of the court to determine which one is the truth. Mm -hmm. I can accuse any governor or minister of works and say, Lagos is by the expressway, two billion. You should account for it. Well, yeah, the two billion was, people say, oh, it's a whole lot of money. But when you now begin to investigate the matter, you might discover that this minister has not taken a dime out of this fund. So I don't want us to draw our conclusion based on speculations. It is true that we should not uh, get people that are corrupt, and some governors have left their states in debt. But the fact of the matter is that not all of them. And even when you are talking about the government should be technocrats, it's also not all technocrats that are automatically honest people. Mm -hmm. We pay some people to come and manage the CBN, we saw what happened. These are so-called Harvard University, this, that, other what. Give them an assignment. They mess up the whole thing. We have seen governors that have performed. And even when you pick technocrats, there is no indication, because the issue is political ambition, that they will not seek to be yeah, governor. We saw that. Yes, if you made a technocrat, they may now be working to be the, next, the governor of their That's state. Right. So I think our focus should be on people that are credible, people that are honest, people that will add value the government, people that also have experience. So if they will have governors that are clean, that are honest, that you know are credible, that will add value to the to the to the country, I don't see any reason why they should not be picked. It does not mean that when you pick a former governor, then automatically we you know you don't perform well. That is not right. So I think emphasis should be on merit. And you can have technocrats who are not good. You can also have as, uh, state governors that are not good. You can also have Former governors that are good. And don't forget, out of the president we have been having since 1999, I think it's only Obasanjo that was not a former 
governor. Even Buhari was a former governor of Northeastern State. Jonathan Jaradua, you understand the point. And even the current president of this country, the former governor. So on that basis, you cannot say, uh, you know, former governor should not be given appointment. There is a scramble for positions, and there are so many interests contending. I know some people don't want the former uh, governors to contest, not because, not, I'm talking of, I'm not talking of future Ajimuda now, mm. but some people that, oh, in my state, if, if this man is the most powerful person, they will pick him. So I have to rubbish any former governor from my state. So there is a, you know, interests are coming up to contest, I mean, to, to contend for the uh, positions available. I, my advice is that the president should pick people that are credible, people that are honest, and people that will add value to his own, uh, you know, to government and be able to ensure that the government perform, performs very well. All right, so it means we shouldn't generalize that uh, some of these past governors have nothing to offer. It's just like saying all journalists are corrupt. Mm. All journalists take bribes. Right. All journalists take bribes. You can't generalize. But I go with what um, Mr. Dio has said. And then these people should also not forget that there's a constitution with which we work. That constitution says people must be picked as ministers from all states of the federation. So if the man who is going to pick them needs will need either recommendation or knowing those people himself. Because you just can't pick strangers to come and work with you. You need somebody you trust to be able to tell you, this man, as they have said he is, so he is. You know, there is a difference between what they tell you somebody is and what the person actually is. A huge world of difference. That, for me, is number one. Number two, like we have seen in the administrations that we've had since we returned to democracy, the body language of the man who is at the end of affairs also says a lot to his lieutenant. Mm. So they are likely to fall in line knowing that the CNC is watching over them. And we have a few examples. Though there are people who on their own, they are quite good with whatever they are doing, wherever they find themselves, not even waiting for the head of department or the head of. We've had ministers like that in the past. We've had Rabatun Deraji Fashola. We've had Rutimi Amici. A couple of them we can mention who have done well, despite the fact that a lot of things were wrong. And the body language of the CNC also did not give that confidence for them to go ahead in some instances. And what do I mean by that? There are certain elements that are close to the president, who are closer to him than those ministers, who can determine the way things will run. Mm. We've had that. In the case of NMPC, we've had it in the case of CBN. Even the, before any matter we get to the CNC, they're already there. And the CNC so much believes in them that if those who are coming with the reports don't behave themselves, they're going to be shown the way out of office. We've had ministers who have had to live in such inglorious manner because they did not pander to what those who, are, who, who have more of the heirs of the president were saying than, look at the case of Kemi Adiosho. Look at the way she left. By the time the real facts came out and people saw it, it was like, why did we miss such an opportunity? So the body language of the man who is at the top will eventually put people in their place. And if they are not going to fall in place, it shows them out. Because that is where we are now. Nigeria cannot afford to have people whose only mentality is to borrow. 
Right, Mr. Dato, I, 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 okay, let me allow you. Lan. No, no, go ahead. I agree with you, but I mean, looking at uh, where the country is today and enormous challenges ahead of this administration, would it be fair to at least agree with those who are saying maybe we need fresh faces this time around? And if Senator um, Adesha Ogunlewe could say that uh, President Buhari's appointment of former governors into his cabinet as ministers is partly responsible for the non-performance witnessed in some critical sectors. Uh, how, how many governors were in that cabinet? That's one. Number two, I just mentioned two ex-governors who people credit till today for doing well. I mentioned Baba Tunde Raji Fashola, who was part of that government. That's one out of many. I mentioned, that's why I said, it depends on the man who is, who is doing the apostles. That's, that's, let's give an open mind. Let's look at those who can deliver on their mandate. They may be former governors, but they've done well. It's not all of them who did not do well. It's not all of them. All right. And a lot of these appointments, don't forget, we, we, that's why we've missed it in this country. We, we, we make them politically based because if he sits in power, the man who must come from that state must okay. have So yeah, that I mean, brings me to my next question as we, you know, wrap up. I mean, there are reports that the president will uh, come up with some names this week. However, yeah. uh, they say the president is torn between appointing party men and technocrats. How will you advise the president to go about that? Well, <laughs> the logical question we should ask ourselves is this. Do we have technocrats among the party men? The okay. answer is yes. Yeah, a lot of them. The answer is yes. So, um... It means that it's a dilemma for the, pros, uh, for the president, but the simple solution is that he has to pick good people. There are technocrats who are party men. So you cannot say because you want to pick from party men alone. Then, you know, the, what, what we should advise the, the president, I, I think the argument that we don't want to be seeing the same old faces in 1999 is valid. Very valid. At the same time, we must also be conscious of the fact that we cannot do with people. Right. You know, look at, you mentioned Fashola. I mean, if we are talking about judgment of Buhari, you, are, you mentioned Fashola now. He wrote, you know, you mentioned Fashola, even Ameshi too, you talk about uh, railways. So some past uh, the former governors, you know, that we have seen, they perform very well. Even for me when he was in the solid mineral. Yeah. So we cannot yeah. say he did well. So we can't say that we should not pick, uh, you know. So he has to balance, you know, the two interests, All right. you know. All right then. Our president, Bola Tinubu, is one month old in office and his performance has received mixed reviews. After his swearing in as president and commander-in-chief on the 29th of May, he has changed the service chiefs, suspended CBN governor and EFCC chairman, floated the Naira and more. While some analysts support his policies, others criticize him. I mean, some persons are saying... Uh, the accolades given to the president for now is just because this is just the only moon period. <laughs> well, also, we should not forget the fact that on one side of that, of that divide are people who have said, since I return to democracy, the incumbent appears and is actually, in my opinion, the most prepared for the job. When a man gets into office and decisions can't be taken on issues that are pending in a swift manner, then there is a problem. And that problem will keep trailing that administration for as long as it remains in office. You recollect on the issue of um, the subsidy that the president said at a function that it was discussed before his inauguration. And then two of the people who are now his special advisors, they removed it from his speech. But he knew from the onset where he was going. So he put it into that speech. <clears throat> when I was, while listening to that speech, I told somebody with me, I said the way this man mentioned this issue of subsidy was just from the blues. It's mm -hmm. not part of that. It was, uh, yeah, it was there. So it means he knows where he, where he wants to go. It may look to some people that it's uh, the, what, what we have come to uh, 
saying Nigerian parlance, initial gragra, IGG, that is doing. But we are beginning to see a pattern that we expect. The fuel subsidy removal, it has generated its own reactions, but it is also showing us that we have the capacity to also think right. You would have heard what the NLC said after meeting with government. They are not asking for increment in salary again, which is what I have always advocated, that when there is an increase in certain uh, services, what public servants should be looking for should not be increment in salary. It should be able to cushion the effects. Because the moment you increase salaries, inflation jumps in. And then we keep going like that. They have also seen that without going to straighten the Naira out against the dollar, which is virtually what is spent in Nigeria, any salary you give any worker tells into insignificance. I ask people, how much is 30,000 Naira, which is the minimum wage now in dollar? It's, it's, not, it's, about, it's less than $50. So if you have $50 in your hand, and you are saying increase it to $100, inflation will still catch up with it. It will still go back to that $50. $50 because what you have just done is to increase the volume of Naira and not the strength of the Naira. So if he has done some of these things, and we are beginning to see that there is some hope, not in the next one week, two weeks, two months, mm -hmm. maybe one year, and we can hold on and see, then we can begin to say, OK, you, 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 you did not deliver, despite the fact that Nigerians gave you the opportunity to do so. Who was not happy when the, when the CBN governor was suspended? Actually, I was, because I went through a lot during the period of the uh, in, in cash, cash crunch. He mentioned it also. So meaning that, despite the fact that he is also a big man, he's part of them. <laughs> he, he felt it too. In the case of Bawa, how will you be fighting corruption and you are yourself alleged to be corrupt? That's why I said, there is a difference between they say this is who this man is and who he really is. If the man has been Obnobbing with corruption, but making face as if he's a very pious man, then he should be dealt with. It, it shows that we are going somewhere. It's not like some past administrations where we have had it's only a rumor. Let's just leave him. Don't probe him. Let him remain in office until he then the man then offends the political gladiators and they go and ambush him on the road and remove him as EFCC chairman. We, are, we shouldn't be at that level again. We should be at the level where we have. Confidence in our administration, in our president especially. What is his body language saying? If his body language is saying to us that this man abhors corruption and he means well, people will fall in line. There was a time in this country that you get to the bus stop. Nobody needs to tell you to kill. You know you must kill because it was something not allowed by the regime in power. We've lost it now. Look at driving on the road. Look at how people behave. In the past, it wasn't like that. And the unfortunate thing, which I, which I also find, once we get out of this country, we behave ourselves. We learn how to join the queue. We learn how to use the word please. Once we come back, we'll but once back to... we come back, it becomes a problem. So a lot of these things we must begin to look at from where are we coming from? Is it a situation where some people do round tripping with the dollar? And those who want to do business genuinely, they are losing out. The issues that must now be attended to after all of this is how to consolidate. Let us see. Can we make power more stable so we we'll use less of petrol? Can we make power more stable so we don't buy generators? Can we make Ajaokuta, for instance, to work so that instead of bringing in all the plants that we need to use in this country, we can begin to manufacture something?
Can we make the rail more functional? So that instead of taking a train ride from Lagos to Ibadan for 6,000 naira, you have more wagons, maybe like 200 on it. And then I can pay 200 naira to go to Ibadan. Those are the issues we must begin to demand accountability from our government now. But let's begin somewhere. Let there be uh, a foundation on which we can build. We have a lot of things on which we need to hold this government accountable. This government must be held to account on a lot of things. You have given us promises. We have seen you have started. Don't let it be a flash. Let it be permanent. All right. Thank you very much, Mr. Dotson. So, I mean, we're talking about first 100 days. And <clears throat> in the first 32 days, the president has taken some uh, very strong decisions. Mm -hmm. Which of these uh, policy reforms or decisions would you consider the most impactful or the boldest? Well, for me, I think it's the attempt to unify the Asian trade. Because we are likely a consumer society. Um, Situation where manufacturers and not source foreign exchange. They have to go to the black market. And uh, officially, some people sell dollars to portfolio businessmen who only business is to make money. They don't sell, they don't buy. They just buy dollars. You know, they don't buy, produce anything. They don't produce goods. So I think that's, that, that, that's a courageous step that we have not seen that since uh, 1999. And I think it demands a lot of courage to be able to do that. Where on the issue of subsidy, there have been that debate that at a point, you know, the current president did not support the removal of subsidy. But I think we need to be honest. The circumstances differ, you know, with about 77 trillion naira now on the ground as debt. You know, inflation rate 21.34 percent. Mm -hmm. In 2015, it was about 9%. Yeah, right? yeah. Every Nigerian is indebted to the tune of 345,000. Even two year old, if we divide our debts, everyone is showing about 345,000. Now, if we are producing uh, crude oil and we are selling, let's say, you know, $67, if we share what, about 1.67 uh, barrels of oil that we produce per day, it will come to about 500 naira per person. So Nigeria is, at this moment, is in, in a major crisis. Major. I was reading a report recently, and I, I read that Nigerians that have up to 500,000 naira in their account, they're just less than 2 million people mm. that have 500,000 naira in their accounts. So, and let us be honest. You, even though we call him national leader of APC, he was not part of this year, you know, there was a conscious effort to isolate him in other political realms. Political parties will take decisions and then we implement it. But in the past eight years, a small caucus that isolated a lot of people, including the current president, they were in charge. So in terms of monetary policy, in terms of fiscal policy, it wasn't part of the system. There was no consultation. Even the other millionaire that said candidates should pay, I'm sure if he had this way, he would have opposed it. And you could see a situation where the hegemony was opposed to his emergence, even up to the last day, even after he won the election. He was still scheming to ensure that he didn't get there. So it was not part of, it was part of the party, but it was not involved in terms of guiding them, in terms of, you know, so that we are going to be, we are going to see a lot of sharp differences from where we are coming from. So I don't want us to say, because the past eight years, the party didn't win another, then we are going to have a continuation. No, there is going to be a sharp difference. And I think we have seen that clearly. I also need to add that, for those who are saying that, oh, the man is half dead and all that, for 30 days, he didn't travel only once. So. And if you, if you are following him on Twitter, you see that every day he can tweet 10 times. When he traveled to France, you could see how agile he was. So and I believe that, you know, we should, in life, we should learn not to wish anybody dead. I also know that some people are wishing somebody dead. Perhaps they are no more. So we should be conscious. <laughs> don't, don't let us wish people dead. I believe the man, and, uh, in fact, in Nigeria, you know, in Africa, if you are over 60, there is no way you don't have one head challenge or the other. So we should just try and, you know, see how we can move forward, you know. Constructive criticism he is desperate to perform. We are also desperate to see changes. You know, we have suffered for too much, yeah. for so long, you know. So we, we wish that, you know, it needs to go ahead with other 
striking decisions, especially those that will form his cabinet. I want to see some radical faces. I want to see some honest people. I want to see radical decisions in the judiciary, in the central bank. You know, we are talking about there is a pro panel set up by the House of Assembly, the ad hoc committee, you know, looking at refineries. They discovered 11 point something billion, trillion spent on, you know, turnaround maintainers. Who are those people responsible? Where is the money? Right. Why subsidies come? So we need to retrieve the, back this money, even though we are not sending them to jail. We need to get people to return stolen funds so that we can service our debts and then have enough money to take care of the masses. Right. So, Mr. Dotu, I mean, the president is very keen on tackling um, the security challenges facing us. I mean, he uh, appointed new service chiefs, met with them, and he has asked for synergy with other uh, sister agencies in the country, especially on intelligence sharing. Well, we've been hearing that for long. And um, what we have seen that has been baffling is the fact that these people, when you go back to their background, you see that they belong to the same set in their course in Nigerian Defense Academy, meaning that they grew up as friends. Mm -hmm. So if I, if I happen to be in the same class with you, and then we're all appointed as service chiefs, what can be the problem that I won't be talking to you? It shows that there is more to it than we are saying. And if you ask me, I think it has to do with preparation for retirement. Meaning that everybody is trying to see, how can I grab before I, retire. before I retire? Because we have the same purpose. You have men under you who are being killed. Mm -hmm. I have men under me who are being killed by bandits, who are being killed by gunmen, ones that we have decided to call unknown. Mm -hmm. And then we are not talking to ourselves. I still refer people to what happened in Liberia and Sierra Leone? How Nigeria went in after the US could not even resolve it. And we resolved that issue. I'm sure you recollect it was the Nigerian troop led by Brigadier General Victor Malu, I mean, I then Brigadier General, who went into where Charles Taylor was to bring him out. Foot soldiers, fantastic officers that we have. So why? Are we finding it difficult at home to ensure things are done? It means there are a lot of things going on behind the scene that we are not privy to. We should be able to, it, this, these things, we, now we have generals who are combatants. Things should change. Across all the services, all of them are combatants. They are not um, admin people now. The oppression people who should be able to do these things. If things go wrong now, then we know that it is still a continuation of the old system where there is no synergy because of what each person wants to benefit from the system. Because if, if you have synergy, how much, say how much we, we, we devote to security and then we are getting into problem over and over again. See how many generals we have who cannot sit together and plot, I mean, uh, moves. To take, well, I, I was in Liberia a couple of times, and I saw when they would gather in the morning and say, okay, this is where they are. This is where we move to. The army takes its own brief. The Air Force takes its own, and then they move. There was that synergy. We can sit together and work together. That's what we want to see in, in, in Nigeria. How many are even these people that we are fighting against? Intelligence is important. We have NIE, we have DMI, the police has its own. Everybody has an intelligence branch. The DSS is even all about that. So why are they unable to work together? 
despite all we have been pumping into, into our security. I think Mr. President should ensure that he stands by his word. Anybody who is seen to fall out of line, we don't need to wait until a disaster happens before we show that person the way out. So, Mr. Adeyo, do you agree with Mr. Dotto on the fact that there might be more than what we can see? I'm asking this question because, I mean, in recent years, defense spending in Nigeria has been on the increase. Yeah. From what we know, it's now superior to other sectors yeah. of, of the economy. So, and some have blamed this uh, persistent insecurity uh, issue on lack of accountability in those appointed to oversee this. this, this. Absolutely. Uh, I agree with him because um, corruption is a major issue in Nigeria. And uh, we cannot isolate any institution from the cancer of uh, corruption. And uh, even we, there are, you know, a lot of celebrated cases concerning, you know, the security forces where issues of uh, corruption, you know, have been raised. So I think that is a major problem. Um, between 2015, for, 80, for the past 80 years, Nigerian security trackers claim that some 63,000 mm -hmm. people, you know, 63,111 were killed. Mm -hmm. So security is a major problem in Nigeria. And when we are talking about corruption regarding uh, security, it's not just about people stealing funds. It also means that people subvert the rule. They collaborate. They give information. Mm -hmm. They sponsor terrorism. And we have seen reports, you know, funders of terrorism, as of foreign countries have you know, mentioned their names and all that, we discovered that some of them are also close to government. So there is some level of confidence that that will change. You know, in my own community, where a kidnapping almost it used to happen almost every two, two weeks. I tell you, in the, in the last one month, we have, not, uh, we have not recorded just one single case of kidnapping. That's the own personal biographical experience on my own part. So I believe that uh, we need to tackle corruption in, a, in, a, in the security realm. But beyond that, we also need to tackle the question of uh, providing essentials of life for people. And that's why all along we have noticed that uh, banditry, terrorism, is found in the poorest states of Nigeria. We are talking of Yobe, Brono, Sanfara. Go and look at the unemployment rate in those areas. Go and look at uh, the number of children out of school. So we cannot just be talking about having good soldiers. We also need thinkers. We need good economic policies so that wherever there are meetings going on, it's not just about Air Force, Navy. We also need to let the Nigerian um, you know, Bureau of Statistics, they need to be there. You know, the Statistician General of Nigeria needs to be there so that when you are comparing the statistics of dropout of unemployment in certain areas, that's a signal to you that you are going to have some level of problems. So I believe, I have confidence, you know, the people that have been picked, if you look at uh, uh, General Agbaja, if you also look at the CDS, people have, mm -hmm. have had people talk about him on several occasions, about his uh, credibility, about his professionalism. So we are waiting to see this in, in practice, in practice. So in the next few six months, we hope to see some uh, fundamental changes. In terms right. of so what other things. sectors do you uh, want the president to focus on? Ah, well, the way we are, he has to pay attention to virtually everywhere. Um, but, but just um, one point on the other issue we discussed, we, we, we are going to leave. When uh, the Kubo went to the villa and made a statement that military behind altar, and some of those spokesmen, especially that of the Navy, challenged him to name names, I think they, are, they always forget that this is the era of the internet. We've had Rear Admiral jailed for a term. And this were years, just some years back. So that is the pointer we need. Some people are benefiting from all of these infractions. And that is why some of those things are not happening. I think. Uh, our president should, apart from the economy and corruption, also look at related issues like um, 
transportation, road, rail, and air. They are becoming quite expensive now. How do other countries do it? Can we learn a lesson? Even the waterways. In Lagos, for instance, we have a lot of people living in areas where they can use the water to get to work, go back home, or even go to sleep. But they don't because of safety. Mm -hmm. So they would rather drive. Somebody living in, in the Kurudu going to the island or going mm -hmm. to Apapa uh -huh. <laughs> can go by, 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 by sea yeah. and go by the water. But they won't because of safety issues. So areas, so many of them, and um, if he's able to tackle insecurity, fix the issue of um, our refineries, fix our Jaukuta, and then uh, ensure that we build our foreign reserve in a way that we can begin to reduce our debts. It will be good for the country because in the last few months, that force has been greatly de depleted for reasons of servicing our consumption of dollar in the mm -hmm. country. That's what we are using. All right. Gentlemen, let's take a break, take some water, and we'll be right back. Please stay with us. DVC News first with breaking news. We cover the big political stories in Nigeria, but people want more than just politics. Business news, sports naturally, but you need news to live by also. Stories about education, health, personal finance, and hey, even lifestyle news. Newspaper reviews, travel news, and much more. Nigeria, it's more than just politics. It's live. Start your day with us every weekday. TVC News Breakfast. First, fast, balanced, and accurate. TVC News. First, with breaking news. The National Assembly is a busy place. As the bastion of democracy, it is a place where bills are presented, motions debated, laws made and the yearnings of the people are laid bare. Come with us as we take you through the workings of the National Assembly. We take you through plenary, committee meetings, and probes, all to ensure smooth working of the democratic process. Welcome back and thank you very much for staying with us. This is Journalist Hangout on Sunday and I have been hanging out with Adewale Adeoye and Dotun Oladipo. All right, gentlemen, let's uh, move on to the next issue. A dialogue is a strategy capable of solving any problem, but adopting it for the security challenges facing Nigeria remains debatable. Former governor of Zamfara State, Senator Sani Yarima, says if bandits are treated the way former militants in the Niger Delta by hundred, banditry could be overcome. Hmm. <laughs> but, I mean, some prominent Nigerians have asked us, we must be careful uh, about those we dialogue with. Let me start with you. We need to be very, very careful. We need to understand the dynamics of, uh, of uh, terrorism, its form and its content. Generally, in principle of conflict resolution, dialogue is a tool. Yes. You know, see even what is going on in the, between Ukraine and uh, Russia. Russia. At the end of the day, they come to the the world fourth, first, second world wars. At the end of the day, they came to you know then uh, to round table. However, we must be able to distinguish between criminals, uh, fundamentalists, and also people. Are advocating for uh, political reasons, violent advocation for political gains. I don't see how we can a country can be talking of negotiating with criminals who are known to be criminals. And I also think that we should not miss up 
the Niger Delta, you know, with the bandits. They are similar, but they are, they are not the same. The Niger Delta that Jesus had defined the territory. He didn't go to other states to start throwing bombs and all sort of things like these other fellows are doing. And their goal was clearly identified. Environmental pollution, resource control, we want to manage our resources. Talking about environment, so we should not mingle the two. They are different. They may be similar. And they had clearly identified the leaders that you can negotiate with. What we have now in some parts of the north is that we have close to 30,000 small, 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 small groups operating in different territories that are also perpetually opposed to each other. In many instances, they fight each other. So, you know, in terms of having an identified, even Boko Haram is split to almost about three, three groups. So, in terms of, when you negotiate with this group, they take your money. The next thing, this other group comes. And then it goes on almost at infinity. So, we must be able to see, if, you know, the, you know, with a, we will be able to look for a sieve to see, if, you know, this negotiation very well. So that if we are going to negotiate with anyone, it has to be on the basis of the fact that that negotiation will be meaningful. The negotiations we have been having in the past shows that it didn't work because most of those negotiations were not done with the best intention. And even we are, we are negotiating with the wrong hands, mm -hmm. wrong people. But we must have a general long-term policy of saying that terrorism must, is, must be destroyed. And that means an economic roadmap, uh, a security roadmap, a socio-political roadmap, a psychological roadmap is not just one uh, program. For instance, look at what is going on in Sudan, in Khartoum. It seems we are quiet, but it's going to split over to, you know, we have almost about thousands of refugees now in Chad from Sudan. We are not talking now. Very soon, many of them will start moving to Nigeria to join some of these bandits. So we need a, an effective policy system, especially our borders. So we need a broad plan to be able to deal with this problem, not just negotiation. There is no guarantee that negotiation will automatically you know, resolve uh, the problems at time. But I don't think we should rule out negotiation where those negotiations are meaningful and be fruitful. All right. So, Mr. Dotun, I mean, the president has said his administration will deploy all strategies available in tackling insecurity. And I think he also uh, mentioned dialogue. So, uh, Doc, uh, Senator Yarima might be on track. Dialogue is fine. Mm. But like uh, Mr. Adi, you said, we must be able to sift things properly in identifying those that we need to dialogue with and those that we need to deal with. Mm. I like that. Like it happened in the Niger Delta, where the amnesty program came up. Perhaps we can say that it will be applicable, at least to a very large extent, in the Northwest. Because those who are agitating there are agitating for justice. We are the ones who are here. You have left us, and we have not had good political leaders to ensure that our lives have meaning. They are Nigerians, except at some point where members of Boko Haram running from the northeast started moving in and they've been cut off now so when you go into a place like zamfara sokoto and all the rest you can begin to talk of negotiation those are our own people what do you want what injustice we've seen a lot of governors who have performed woefully ex-governors who have performed woefully but when it is Christmas, when it is um, Salah period, they keep doing out millions to a few people. Sometimes I wonder, where did they get that money if not stolen funds? Mm -hmm. But that's not what you are supposed to do with it. It's not so for your own political goodwill. It's supposed to be for the people. Why did they fail to build institutions that can take care of the people, provide employment, provide the level playing ground, for people to have their businesses running well. There are some governors and ex-governors who can run a whole state with their funds from, that they have. But you can't say the same thing of those terrorists in the Northeast. They're a different ballgame.
Most of them are foreigners. Like he said, people are, are preparing now to move in from Sudan. If those people come in from Sudan, what are we going to be telling them? That they are our own people or that, don't worry, we will set you so that you can return to where you are going. What are we going to be telling them? Those ones, we need to smoke them out. We need to ensure that they are gone and gone for good. That's why the issue of the service chiefs happen to be critical. So that those guys are cut off from our, from our country completely. Why, what are we going to be negotiating? Nothing. Because they are not even Nigerians. That's what has been discovered. Most of those who form Boko Haram and the ISIS and all the rest, they are not Nigerians. So they don't have a part in our resources. But those in the Northwest, fine, we can sit down. What are the issues? And then, maybe, we've had things like the amnesty program set up in the North. And they begin to talk to them. And then use, like we say, the carrot and stick approach. Because that obviously is still what is in the Niger Delta now. Anybody who breaks the pipeline is gone. Though it's a shame that we now have private companies doing what our military should be doing and doing it better, more effectively. You know? But it's still the same issue of carrot and stick. You can't say you are, you are a militant now and then you go and break a pipeline and think they will now call you, yeah, let's negotiate. You are going to go down for it. So we should know that it's not just a one-way thing of dialogue. Dialogue is fine. There is no way you are going to be able to peacefully resolve any issue without dialogue. All right. So, I mean, you've talked, we've talked about dialogue and he has talked about effective policing. And just like you mentioned, over 60,000 Nigerians have lost their lives in the past um, eight years. And some Nigerians are asking or calling for a multi-stakeholder approach to uh, dealing with insecurity. That's fine. There is nothing wrong with that. We can all sit down. They can, I mean, the government can sit down with people and say, okay, what can we fashion out? But the first thing is that we must have gotten our own selves. That is on the part of the government now. We must get things right. Because when you look at a place like Sudan, that is boiling now, how many meetings have they held? How many meetings? Look at the Liberia that I mentioned. The moment Charles Taylor was taken out, there was some peace in that country. The moment they also got some of the heads of these things and took them out, there was peace. So we must realize that it's not just about sitting down, but identifying where the challenges are. If there's somebody you need to take out, take the person out. It's not by death. It's not by killing. Move him away from where he is. After all, Charles Taylor was here in Lagos for, for, for about some years. So meaning that he's far away from whatever is happening there. It's just a matter of denying that person access to communicate. Take them out. And then you can begin to talk. But it's not talking alone without action. We will not resolve our problem. All right. Thank you, Mr. Dutton. Now, Mr. Doye, let me come to you. And this is still about uh, the call for a multi-stakeholder approach to tackling this issue. I mean, you know, sometimes there have been talks about state governors being overwhelmed. Yeah. But these governors say uh, that they maintain that the security arrangements in the country as enshrined in the Constitution makes them handicapped. That is absolutely true. My colleague said something about a private company you know, in Niger Delta, is solving these problems more than uh, our own security. That is true. Why? That is the principle of community policing. They are from that community. They live there. So they know all the roots, all the Greeks. And they are, have been brought in as stakeholders in the protection of lives and property. But in a situation where you bring the com police commissioner from Lagos mm -hmm. and the beginning of Lagos State, you take him to Sokoto, then my DDPO is from uh, Sanfara. What sense of belonging are you giving? Who does not understand that? Yes. Mm. 
But if indigenous people are part and parcel, security is not a property you just dash us. It's our property. We need to be part of it. We need to be involved. Do you know that governors want to get drone? They need to apply through National Security Advisor. In Abuja. In Abuja. <laughs> what kind of thing is that? How many times have you had the sort of general of police in the UK, the sort of general of police in the US? And we, are, we copy the same system, then we now bastardize it. We need to have an effective system that recognizes the role of indigenous communities in, in policing, in protecting their own property, in protecting their own lives. So that is where we should be looking uh, at. That should be our next step. Communities must be involved. Community policing, policemen should have, you know, policy is not just about carrying guns. It's about psychology, knowledge of psychology, knowledge of history, knowledge of culture, knowledge of environment. If you don't have all that, you just carry your gun and go somewhere. If America, when America wanted to fight in Iraq, for about 15 years, that predicted there would be a war. Mm -hmm. And they have been sending their advanced team, going there, working as uh, uh, um, uh, NGOs, working as uh, priests, going from one place to the other, going to the uh, mosques and all that, getting information about the spirituality of the people, about the culture, about the heritage. Before, so it became easier for them to take out Saddam. So we, we need to know that security is not the property of people in Abuja, it's our property. And I hope that we should be thinking of what is take, uh, you know, uh, the stakeholders approach. Uh, community people need to be involved. The economic aspect is very important. The environment, you know, is very important. Media people are also very important. All sort of, you know, lies and also the social media organizations. I'm happy somebody leading one of the best online media is here who are trying to fight for professionalism. But there are all sorts of other groups that just write all sorts of things, all sorts of lies that mislead the people about security and also write um, stories that can threaten national stability. So everybody needs to be involved, including online publishers. And I think if we can recognize uh, the, the import of multi-stakeholders approach, we will realize that security is not just for soldiers and policemen alone, it's for all of us. And I think we are going to have better results if we adopt that uh, all right, so Mr. Dotson, if the governors are saying the security arrangements as enshrined in the Constitution makes them handicapped, I mean, they've considered this a step backward in this fight against insecurity. This is a, uh, this is a fresh administration. What would you advise in this regard? Well, we've been talking about um, state police for so long. You mentioned it in person. Mm. When you go to where we copied our democracy, which is the U.S., what you have there, which they spoke about, Sometimes it was a national guard. You have New York Police Department, Los Angeles Police Department. All states have their own police department. What they do when criminals are fleeing across state borders is to collaborate so that it's more effective. When the idea of um, having constabulary policemen came up, it sounded nice to me until I heard that these guys are not being paid. You should go and train them in how to gather intelligence, mm. you give them the uniform, and then you expect them to do it for you for free. And they're not going to feed their families. And you want to engage them in security issues. So some, some of the things that we do, they are neither here nor there. We have our affairs about state police. Some of the governors in the southwest, in the Northeast, they came together and said, okay, let's have geopolitical security arrangement. We're having more peace now in the Southwest, especially when you look at the Ekiti, Undo axis, especially in Undo, which leads out into the North. We're having peace now because those Amotekun guys understand the terrain far better than the policemen and soldiers. When you go to Bono State, those who are combating the terrorists, they don't go out now without members of the Civilian Joint Task Force because those guys understand the terrain. They know where to go. They know who among them 
is an informant. They know this, they know that. So it's easier. While the soldiers do the firing and all the rest, they with their small guns that we call shakabula, just to protect themselves, are giving them intelligence. This is, uh, this is where to go. This is, this is where to follow. So it means, just like politics, security is also local. You can't wish it away. These are the kind of people, this is the kind of uh, step we should take. Where those who are policing the community, they know everybody around. They can say if a stranger drives, I mean, drives in. Not the man, like you said, who has come from Lagos to go and police Nassau State. He's just going to go there, sit in his office, and Wait. in about two years, he's going to be moved again, go and take up another challenge. In one year, where he is, he's moved again. So we should have a better arrangement. If we have copied that democracy from the US, then we should copy it well. Because a lot of the things that we copy, we are misusing it. We are, we are turning it upside down. And that is why it is affecting us. We must go back. There are a lot of, if not for the bastardization, some groups are doing well in terms of combating uh, insecurity. Outside of the Southwest, where we have the OPC, other regions are trying to do a few things. But they are bastardizing them. Some started in Kano, is this Yankari, or we, you know, they bastardized them. But go anywhere today in Lagos, where you have OPC providing night guard service, and tell me if they have robbed in that area. Because they are the local guys who understand what it means, what it takes. If somebody who is a stranger wants to come and rob in my community, can't know more growth than I do. I've lived in, in a certain part of Lagos where armed robbers will, will jump the fence into that community. Before they land, they are, they are dead because the guys are watching. They know where to wait for them. Once they are in the night, they know where to wait. Maybe you are calling me with sophisticated guns, but we are already waiting for you behind the fence. I mean, so he briefly talked about the welfare of these officers. And I know many Nigerians are saying a lot of times it's not about huge budgetary um, expenditure or heavy weapons that, you know, fight wars, but soldiers with the right frame of mind. Uh, uh, you know, exactly. You know, training is not just about handing of guns, you know, uh, psychological training. Like those uh, policemen were talking about that ran over, you know, um, you know a, a human being. We know that they need some kind of a psychological training. And even, you know, when people go to work, you notice and all that, there is the post war uh, trauma therapy. You know, many of them have watched uh, blood, they have seen blood, they have seen people killed in the most savage manner. It, they are tortured. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why you see in developed countries, they also pass through a lot of spiritual, you know, uh, healing. That's why in the army you have chaplain department. What they do is that they give spiritual hope. To people who have seen World War because they are traumatized. Denied. Some of them cannot even sleep. And sometimes they begin to develop hatred for their environment. And it could spur violence. You know, they could begin to attack people and you know, even commit all sort of things that is not out of their own uh, free will. So the training needs to be comprehensive. However, I'm also talking about uh, welfare. Sometimes I see policemen when I'm passing through. I will see them around 6 a.m. When I'm passing through in the evening, they are still there. And I wonder who takes care of their food. Well, I mean, for working for that kind of long stretch of hours, you know. So we need to also ensure, uh, know that policemen are human beings, soldiers are human beings. Their welfare, their family, their children is all, all of importance to us. Look at our barracks everywhere. When you are talking about barracks, what comes to your mind is, uh, you know, shanties. Mm. Shanties. They, are not, they don't deserve to live in those areas. Insurance for them, good health care for them, those things are very important. If, if you don't put them in that kind of um, psychological state, economic state, they will not be able to fight you know, genuinely to protect the country. And I also think to add this, when I'm talking about uh, negotiation, we need to broaden the scope. It's not only NATO, hmm? the East, where we have IPOP and all that. We need, it's not negotiation, it's not just for bandits in the North. People also agitating for self determination. We need to work out a framework that will bring everybody together to the negotiating yeah. table.
All right. Thank you, gentlemen. Now let's move to the final lap of the program. It appears the federal government has begun to reap the benefits of fuel subsidy removal. Operators within the downstream oil and gas sector said the federal government has raked in 400 billion naira due to fuel subsidy removal in the last 30 days. I mean, so it looks like the times are gradually setting in. <laughs> I mean, well, it's it's good news. Yeah. It's good news for their affairs mm. about this good news. What, two of them for me, to what use are we going to put these savings? Number two, Nigerians are very bothered about sacrificing for a government that is seen to be wasteful, and extremely so. Certain things that have happened in the past week that have made Nigerians to question what governance is all about in the country. Yes, it's still too early in the life of the administration to say the government is wasteful. But these were the same kind of signs that have trailed past administrations. The figures just spend as it is. There, there was this argument last week over the convoy of the president from the airport to some parts of Lagos. Some have argued that it's, um, it's supporters that constituted mm -hmm. the bulk of what ordinarily we know what the president's convoy looks like. We should start talking about that now. We should also start the debates on the number of aircraft in the presidency. There are so many experienced Nigerian Air Force pilots flying those aircraft that should be serving the country especially in the area where we have issues in the Northeast and Northwest. This government should be prudent. In the villa, I'm sure we don't have less than 1,000 security men. In the villa, only. So if we are withdrawing security men from VIPs, we should also scale down what they have. A report today has identified what the past government budgeted for feeding and transportation for the president and vice president this year, running into billions. We should be looking at those things so that when you are telling Nigerians, sacrifice, sacrifice, you can also see that sacrifice on your part. I don't see any reason why a state government to host the president to homecoming? I don't. Mm. I mean, that was not Fuga. A colleague, a senior journalist, when we went to the US for Obama's election, he asked the governor of Maryland, which is the host capital for the U.S. So what's your relationship with the president? He said, what kind of relationship? He's doing his work. I'm doing mine. Since I was elected, I have not entered the White House. Abuja should not be a mecca for our governors. They should sit in their states and think. Find a way out of our problems. The money we are sharing in Abuja should be like an addendum to what they're able to think and generate in their own states. They should not be going to visit the president, Rankadidi, so that their um, re-election is guaranteed. Those are the wastages we are talking about. And when they move, some of them go, some of them practically live in Abuja. That's where they live, because they are playing more politics than governance. And when they move, you see some governors with as many as 50 policemen 
soldiers, DSS running after them, people who should be tackling our security issues, challenges. Like you, like you rightly said, some of these things need to be brought to the table for stakeholders to discuss. Who is running after these people to kill them? That they need this massive protection. You see, there was a video that was shown. Some said uh, some people joined the convoy of the Senate president. But we saw him. Bulletproof vehicles. With him. Because they were DSS policemen. Those vehicles are fueled by the government. Those guys earn extra allowances for protecting these government officials. And we put them to better. So the government should not just be telling us about what we are saving. We should know where this money will go into. What is it going to, what purpose is it going to serve? Are you telling me that you have gotten 400 billion? Okay, we are adding two more or three more coaches to what is running between Lagos and Ibadan. We have, um, Ajakuta needs so, 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 and so. This refinery on which we have spent 11.3 million, we are now being serious, so we are going to finish it with this 400 billion. Those are the things Nigerians want to hear. We don't just All want right. figures. So, Mr. Adoye, I mean, before I have you react to this, uh, what he just said, and that's the political will yeah. to cut excessive spending. Yeah. Um, this removal of fuel subsidy looks like an economic necessity, isn't it? Yeah, I personally think subsidy should be in certain areas should be responsible of government. Most governments in you know develop what they subsidize agriculture, transportation. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, Those are areas we should be looking at. Without subsidy. However, realizing the mess that we find ourselves, uh, we need a transparent form of subsidy remover. A remover that people will appreciate at the end of the day. A remover that will transform the lives of Nigerians, that their sacrifices will not be in vain. The remover we have, the removers we have been having in the past, they are not justifiable. Okay, we were late last year we were paying 180 something. 85. 85. But between that late last year and June, the, even the, the claim there was subsidy. We were so we were paying 300 naira, 250 naira. What happened to that difference between that period? And you said that time there was subsidy. So there is all, there is a whole lot of corruption in Nigeria. Nigerians are ready to make sacrifices, but they want to see that those sacrifices are not in vain. He spoke about, you know, they spoke about 400 billion, good. That will just give us about maybe 5 trillion in one year. It's not even up to 10% like, of the 77 trillion we are owing. So we still have a long way to go. But I think cutting waste uh, is something we just need to address. Our senators, also our representatives, governors, an interview I read with uh, Shibolaige, who was then minister, or power. He said each minister had, he was talking about 19 vehicles that he complained with. I don't know how many vehicles they have these days. You can imagine what it costs to fuel mm. these vehicles. So, cutting waste is not just about presidential fleet alone, it's also about our own institutional corruption. You know, the Revenue Mobilization and Fiscal Commission. When you see state governors, the first thing they do when there's a new, new set of people in parliament, new new cars. 20 million, 30 million for, for members of, of parliament. Mm -hmm. And then you buy a car of 20 million for a traditional ruler that has no ball in his community. Oh, ball that will cost well, just 1 million naira. Mm -hmm. If you go to the primary schools in those communities, you don't find good shares. That will just probably cost about 1 million naira. But the traditional ruler is, you know, oh, the governor has given me, you know, a good 20 million naira worth of car. So we need to address, if we really want to tackle you know, um, waste. We need to uh, tackle and uh, address this problem. We have executive order 003 that says MDAs should buy made in Nigeria goods. Nobody is following it. You know, it pro, you know, produces a lot of, but we still go abroad. And when you are sourcing raw materials, manufacturers are struggling to have forex, but they will not get it. But always the state government or federal government that wants to import cars for, you know, directors. So it's not just about civil service, it's not just about governance, you know, even direct, uh, civil service. Look at the cast directors use, civil servants, bank executives, even though they are uh, private institutions, they, they perform public functions. Go and find out how they are uh, CEOs, how they live. 
on public funds. How many microfinances have collapsed this recent time? What did they do with the money? Public funds. A lot of people have been destroyed. Some have five million, six million. But find out where those executives of banks, microfinance, how they live. They live in mansions. They collect loans. Bank directors. So it's not just about government, public institutions alone. Even private institutions that for, uh, perform public functions. functions yeah. You know, a lot of things are happening. They will, you buy something, they debit you. The money didn't go to the, the client. Mm -hmm. Then you are trying to retrieve that money back. Six months. They debited me 20,000 and since February, I cannot collect it back from my bank. Mm -hmm. And I know somebody talking about 100,000 naira. Where does that money go? Corruption in the, in the banking sector. So, you know, we, we are in a mess. And when we talk about government, it's not just government alone. How many, how many people can rely, you know, rely on Nigerian artisans to work for them? Bricklayers, motor mechanics, uh, rewires, crooks everywhere. These days, you see, uh, you know, uh, Tyler, Ghanaian trade. Tisha, Ghanaian trade, they put the symbol telling you that, look, you can't yeah, go you know. pick somebody from, you know, from Togo. <laughs> In those days, it used to be Nigerians, you know. So we have lost a lot of Togolese are here. And you can imagine the capital, uh, capital flight. In millions of them who take money back to their country because our people are no longer reliable. So we need to, you know, we need to address the issue of corruption in our waste in a holistic way. We should also we involve institutional uh, changes. We need to send a lot of laws that give power to people to embezzle funds indirectly, public funds, in a way that uh, undermine our interests. All right, thank you very much. Mr. Dotto, let me have a final take on this. And I must say that I'm happy that we're talking about the fact that the missing link has always been uh, the contribution of leadership to nation building. And of course, it's also very important to reiterate that this cuts across, across all the leadership all, structures. All. Not, it's not just about the governors. All. Because if um, you are telling me that it's a standard that a senator must have so 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 number of eight. And I'll tell you what is that senator doing with those number of aids. We must begin to ask questions. We must begin to ask them. Because we make it look like those who are in government, they must live in opulence. They must, they must be different from us. That is why you find out that some people who become governors, who become senators, once they fall out of favor, their ending is not good because they go into depression. Somebody who has had uh, soldiers running after him, and then he now falls out of favor. And that's why they do everything to remain in to power. To remain in power. Because that's where they... So we, we need to address all of this to make governance less flamboyant. You ask me, yes, it's good when the president arrives that he's welcomed at the airport. But do you see the number of people who go to welcome our president? Imagine driving from Abuja town to the airport with that number of people who will also take their aids to go. We have so many areas where we waste money. I'm telling you. And these things have been proven that they can be done in a cheaper manner. We may not have the time to talk about it today, but some governors have shown us that governance can be cheaper. We have seen governors here in Lagos. Especially one. And we also have Baba some... Uh, who drives with you? He doesn't mm -hmm. chase you away from the road. And his convoy is short. You don't see DSS running by the side of his car when he's in traffic. They don't. It's, that, it's instruction that he gave. Because who wants him out? All right. I mean, I wanted to say that we also have some very high-sounding bureaucratic programs that need to be scrapped. Uh, in like one minute, your final take, Mr. Well, um, I believe... With the Nigerians are anxiously waiting for the president's cabinet. And I think that cabinet, the quality of that cabinet, the, the quality of people there will determine, will give Nigerians and the international community the direction that the government is going. And I just hope God gives you wisdom to make the right choice. All right. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I've been hanging out with Adewale Adewi and Dotsun Oladipo. Thank you very much. It's been a wonderful conversation today. Happy Thank Sunday you. to you once Welcome. again. And thank you very much for watching. That's all on Journalist Tag Out on Sunday. Join us tomorrow for the regular episode of the program at 5 p.m. You can watch the repeat broadcast of this episode tonight at 11.30. We're also on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash TVC News Nigeria. I am Olajumoke Olatunji. Bye for now and God bless Nigeria.
Every major news story is with many perspectives and layered with different levels of impact. Hello. What time did this happen? We will be right there. At TVC News, we follow the big and major news, gathering the facts, witnessing the outcome. I am here live for the aftermath of the approval of the new national minimum wage. We are TV station of the year, not just for breaking news, but for being first, fair and accurate. TVC News.